This lecture is all about algorithmically computing barcodes in the most interesting case for us, which is the case of a filtered simplicial complex when you take the kth homology for all dimensions k. So here is the setup. Uh, we have a filtration, let's say n steps long, of uh, b. So this is a filtration. Of some simplicial complex K, and it will be extremely convenient uh, to sort of earmark which, uh, for each simplex, which is the earliest stage of the filtration, uh, the first subcomplex where it appears. So, of a simplicial complex K. Uh, for each simplex sigma, the birth. Let's call it B sigma is uh, the minimum over all i going from 0 to n so that uh, sigma is in Fik. So this is just for bookkeeping. Um, and so now let's begin to describe our algorithm. So the first thing we need to do is pre process the simplices. So here's the pre processing step. It requires just to keep things well organized in terms of this birth function uh, that's defined on all the simplices. So sort the simplices of k as some sigma 1, sigma 2, and let's say they're big n simplices. So they're um, subject to the following uh, requirements. So uh, sigma comes before tau. If um, either it is born before tau, so b sigma is strictly smaller than b of tau, or uh, the births are equal, but sigma is a face of tau. Um, so aside from these two requirements, the sorting can be arbitrary. So there is no reason to sort them. Um, uh, so within the same birth class, when two things are not faces of each other, you can sort them any which way you like. Um, okay, and here's the input. We're not going to sort of feed it the whole filtration. We're going to feed it a matrix. That's what goes into the algorithm. So uh, the input is uh, big N by a, big N matrix. So consider the matrix, which I'll call D. Um, its rows and columns are going to be labeled by our simplices. So sigma 1, sigma 2, uh, sorted in the right order. So sigma q is somewhere in the middle, sigma big N, and sigma 1, sigma 2, let's say sigma p, and all the way up to sigma big N. And in order to fully specify this matrix, I suppose we should figure out uh, what is in the pth row and the qth column. Um, and so that entry is extremely familiar and well loved. So this is plus minus one if sigma p is a face of sigma q of co-dimension one. So dimension sigma q minus dimension sigma p is one. Another way of saying it is sigma p is sigma q with one vertex removed. If you um, uh, removed an odd vertex, uh, assuming some orientation, then you get a minus sign uh, for the for the before the one and if you removed an even vertex then you get a plus sign so usual number that goes into the simplicial boundary map uh, for the column of q and the row of p um, and zero otherwise so there's no connection um, so this entry is dpq as defined below it's going to be extremely convenient um, also to have some shorthand for what we are calling the columns and the um, um, so for all q we write call q to be the column under sigma q and we write low q to be the um, largest p such that dpq is non-zero um, and we assume 
or set low q equal to zero if no such p exists. And if you think about what's happening uh, with this low number, all it's doing, if you look at a simplex q, uh, sigma q, and then you have a list of its faces appearing with non-zero coefficients in the column down there. And what this low number is doing is picking out the last born one uh, in with respect to our B ordering. Uh, there might be many um, born at the same uh, index, at which case with the same B values, in which case any one of them could be the lowest one. So um, here is the algorithm. So the procedure is, uh, it's quite simple to write down actually, given all the work that it's doing, but it's um, uh, all of it is hidden in the linear algebra roughly. So for Q in the ordered set uh, one through N, so Q increments, oops, one, two, all the way going up to the total number of simplices or the total number of columns of the matrix D. Uh, you set P to be the low of Q, and remember that this P could be zero if the column of Q was zeros, uh, all zeros. And now what you want to do is in case this was non-zero, so while there is some R less than P with the same low value, which also happens to be non-zero, um, we use uh, the column of R to clear out this lowest entry in the column of Q. So what that requires in terms of row operations is adding, uh, let's see if we've got this right, um, I think it should be minus dPQ divided by dPR multiplied by column R. So that scalar multiple of column R to column Q. And this is guaranteed um, to reduce the lowest entry uh, to be in from row P to something less than P. We don't know how far up we will go. And that's and so we keep doing this iteratively until um, the there is no smaller R sharing the same low as the lowest non-zero entry of column P. And that's it. That's the end of the algorithm. Nothing else. Um, this produces a new matrix D prime, which uh, two things to note about this matrix D prime um, are, first of all, it's related to D by just column operations. So we haven't really changed much. It's just related to D by change of basis. And if you bothered um, keeping track of all these column operations, you would uh, be able to create an invertible matrix, which you can multiply D with on the right to get D prime, but there's no need to do that here. Um, the second thing to note is that this matrix D prime has the property uh, that for each column of D prime, um, if its low is non-zero, then there exists no smaller uh, indexed column with the same low. I mean, that's exactly what we did, um, uh, what those column operations were guaranteed to weed out. Okay, once you've produced this matrix, um, it's easy to read off the barcodes um, in every homological dimension. So let's see how to do that. Um, so the best way to do this is to uh, basically make uh, a flow chart for every column. So um, that, that describes the behavior of every column. And let's do it from top down. So the first thing to ask yourself is, um, is column Q of D prime zero? Um, so the column under the simplex sigma Q, is it is it zero? And now there are only two possibilities. Either, um, either it isn't or it is. So if it isn't zero, then uh, that means it has some low. Um, because there, if, if the column is non-zero, there must be a lost uh, row where the entry is non-zero. So set P to be that. Um, and in this case, you add a bar uh, of the form um, whenever sigma P was born, and which this bar terminates whenever sigma Q was born uh, in dimension of sigma P. 
So what's happening <clears throat> is that the insertion of sigma p into the filtration is creating uh, a homology class of the same dimension as sigma p, and then sigma q is putting the last uh, nail in the coffin by making that cycle a boundary uh, at some later stage of the filtration. Okay, so that was pretty easy. Um, if the column is zero, then there's a bit more uh, that one has to do. Uh, here now there are two uh, two options, uh, is it, uh, which are as follows. So is Q itself the low of something, some other column? Um, and now again, this branches into uh, two possibilities. Um, either it is the low of some column, um, or it isn't. And if it is, then the good news is you have to do nothing, which is always fun to do. There's no bars uh, uh, being contributed um, for, for this case. And if the answer is no, then we get a bar um, off the form. So this is going to be an interval, which is born whenever sigma q is born, and it never dies. Uh, and this, of course, is in dimension uh, of sigma q. So um, if you remember the structure theorem for um, uh, classifying persistence modules, uh, this is basically always giving us torsion stuff. And this is always going to be the free part. Um, and the best way to uh, get familiar with this algorithm is to try it on a few very well concocted, tiny, tiny filtrations because it's really painful to do by hand. and certainly. I'm not going to run through iterations of it because the boundary, the, the D matrix gets enormous um, since it, it takes every simplex into account. So basically just writing this D is a pain. Um, but there is the beginnings of uh, one of these worked out in the lecture notes. So I hope you'll take a look at those. See you in the next lecture.